we wake up to the sounds of the Roaring River, a short walk from the campsite. There's something soothing about the sound of flowing water, especially as compared to the sound of lawnmowers, alarm clocks, and road noises. I mean, there are obvious benefits to living on the outskirts of the city, but I can't help but envy those that live riverside, far from the hustle and bustle of city streets. This is where I would rather be nine out of 10 times. Add some great friends to the mix, and this is where I'd rather be all the time if I could. Hi, friends. Rocky's not in the tent. Good morning. Did you sleep well? Yeah. I mean, there's mosquitoes, but yeah. I could, in the middle of the night, I'm like slapping myself because I could feel the mosquitoes on me. Oh. But not too, not too bad. I don't want to start the fire unless there's a big stack of wood. Enough for that I'm not worried about the rest of the night. It's like not even 10 a.m. We don't need a fire. Exactly. That's my opinion. We've made a really big stack of wood so much that like I wasn't even worried about running it all day and all night. Then I would be happy to start. So okay, so stack. let's go chop some wood. So I'm gonna make coffee first. Okay. I was getting eaten by mosquitoes, so I had to put on my full sleeve shirt because my arms, my back, everything is just like eaten up. Yeah. If there's one mosquito in the world, just one, it will circle the world until it finds me and then it will bite me. That's my life. Look at that view. That is a gorgeous view. In the scorching heat, the cold river was calling out to us and it was very tempting to go relax by the water. But first, we had some chores to do before the rest of the crew arrived in the afternoon. Successful uh, tree chopping trip, I believe. Looks like it, looks like some good wood. It is. I believe it's uh, bone dry. <laughs> You get so used to wearing gloves and then you don't have them. <laughs> After making sure everything was set up and ready for our friends to arrive, it was finally time to go down to the river. Ooh, very nice. It's cool because you have this like 180 degree view of the mountain. So that peak right behind that tree is Mount Morrison. That one? Yeah. Pika Peak? Pika Peak? Pika Peak. Oh, like yeah. a Pikachu? Pika Peak. And then we have... Oh, those two little... Those two little humps behind the big one is Plinth Peak. Plinth Peak. Yes. Interesting. There's a way to take pictures and like mm -hmm. line up the peaks with Right. The picture so that you can save it. Yeah, That's it's pretty cool. awesome. Yeah. So it gets really rapidy right there, but around the corner, there's a little like island. And so on like this side of the island is really calm. And like Kai and Rocky were just in there swimming and everything. And that was really So can we swim in it if we get too warm? Yeah, yeah, for sure. About 10 years ago, there was a big landslide here that closed off a lot of that region. Apparently, there used to be a bridge that went south from here towards a hot spring that's uh, really gorgeous. People do still go hiking and, uh, um, you know, on their mountain bikes and stuff, but you're not really supposed to because there's a lot of bear activity as well. Um, by vehicle, it's just impossible because across the river there, there is a road. You can actually see the road going. However, you can also see a little bit of that, that stuff over there, um, which are remnants of the mudslide. It was, I believe, the biggest mudslide in Canada. Also, the bear population in this area needs a lot of time to recover. I believe there's 56 grizzly bears in this entire region, um, which, if you think about it, is a very, very low number. So, yeah, we think, oh, God, there's 56 bears, and that's a big threat to, you know, camping and everything like that. Uh, but in the grand scheme of things, in the if you look at the ecosystem here, it makes a significant impact that the bear population is just so low compared to what it used to be or compared to what it should be to sustain the entire ecosystem. Um, there's supposed to be a lot of fish in this river uh, that the bears are after. There's a lot of berry bushes as we saw on the drive here. 
that attracts a lot of those bears. And black bears, grizzly bears, they're all native to this area and uh, it's, their, it's their region, right? But yeah, so that's the road. Do you see it, Krista? Right there. And then you can see some of the, the slides that happen. But it's really over there once you cross the bend that it's just like completely destroyed. We'll, we can probably drive up tomorrow that way a little bit. Maybe like three or four kilometers before you reach the area where there used to be a bridge, I think. To correct my previous statement, it was the second largest landslide in Canadian history but still one of the largest recorded landslide in the world since 1945. On August 6th, 2010, more than 45 million cubic meters of debris slid down Mount Meager, taking the woods, bridges, roads, and equipment with it. To put things into perspective, the landslide was large enough to send seismic waves more than 2,800 kilometers away into Alaska and all the way down to California. Thankfully, no one was injured or killed, but there were significant socioeconomic impacts to the industry. The loss is estimated to be around $10 million. Nearly 1,500 residents were evacuated and displaced in the lower Lillooet Valley. Since then, a lot has been done on the northern side of the river where we were, but the road remains closed and impassable to the south. All to that to say, some significant thinking regarding disaster management in mountain communities was a direct result of this event. After discussing some of the history of the area, we headed back up to welcome the rest of the crew just in time. There he is. Hello, welcome. We were truly glamping for this part of the trip. Everyone brought tons of snacks and drinks to get comfortable and have a luxury yeah. camping experience making? this time. I am making chicken salad wraps, which like doesn't Ooh. sound super appetizing, but it's, it's like elevated. I like chicken That's salad wraps. Some fancy, fancy looking stuff in the chicken salad. Yeah, well, thank mine's you. usually just chicken and mayo. <laughs> did you did you already make that many wraps? I did. I'm a machine. Dude, no. that's incredible. <laughs> like the dog whisperer suddenly. <laughs> All the dogs. Whoa! Ready to go check out the water? Let's do it. Oh guys, look at this! Wow. What do you think, Dante? What do you think? Cool place? Hey Mizu. How many states have you been to? Uh, 48 out of 50. Cool. Uh, uh, the four, yeah, I'm, I'm missing North Dakota and Hawaii. Okay. Mahalo. Mahalo. What's your, uh, what's your favorite state then? Oh, it depends for what. I mean, uh, nature-wise, I think Utah is pretty awesome. And how does BC compare to all the states you've seen? Uh, BC is an epic beast that I think beats many of the states uh, that I've been to, besides Alaska. Well, yeah. And the, the, the landscape is quite similar to like Alaska and yeah. Yukon. And, um, yeah, for sure. Even Washington State, right? Yeah, uh, and we're from the East Coast, so there's not really much in terms of like off-roading or even like soft-roading or anything like that. So it's really awesome to be able to just drive up to amazing vistas like this, which we could never do out east. That's true. And Rachel, you're Canadian by birth? Uh, yes. I grew up in Sarnia, Ontario. Woohoo! Shout out! Uh, but I've lived in the States most of my life. Okay. Well, welcome back. Cleo's from Maine. It's good to have you. Hi, Cleo. Cleo's from Maine. She was born in Maine. She's nine years old. Well, she's Canadian now. She's yeah, Canadian she now. Loves yeah. She loves it up here, all the adventurers and the dog friends. I, for one, am very glad that Ryan and Rachel decided to move to BC. While chatting about their past adventures, the conversation turned towards archery. So we headed back up to camp where Ryan showed us his archery skills. So for somebody who knows nothing about bows and rather knows about guns, what's like, what's a heavy bow versus a... Anything over 50 pounds is going to get the job done for anything in North America, basically. Um, and then anything above that is just overkill. The only animal that you would need a different bow for is something like a Cape Buffalo in Africa, which I'm never going to hunt. So um, this setup will kill anything in North America. What's with the sea urchins in the string? Uh, they silenced the... Uh, they that looks it. sharp. Yeah, that's a three-bladed fixed blade VPA. Damn. 175 grains. That's these, really sick. These arrows are super heavy. So like that's the new thing that people are into is like super heavy arrows. 
because the because the, the, the quiet so dry fire would be like if I just let it go at full draw, and that happens accidentally a lot for people who can't handle the weight mm -hmm. because you're like not used to when it's gonna how it's gonna feel. Um, what is the largest animal you have hunted with a bow? This white-tailed deer. I got in, I'm an adult uh, onset hunter, so I just start, got into it about three years ago. Mm -hmm. I've been into archery for like 10 years maybe, but I got into hunting only like three years ago. If, if you don't grow up doing it, it's like not something that you have access to really. Archery is hard work. We were getting pretty hungry and it was my turn to cook. So I'm making uh, tacos de carne asada. And uh, unfortunately, it won't be grilled. Carne asada is supposed to be like grilled meat. However, it, I found it easier that I uh, cut it up into little pieces and marinated it, so it'll be good. The secret to a good carne asada is lime juice and orange juice marinade. It makes it very tender, very beautiful. And then all the, obviously all the spices, uh, a little bit of soy sauce, which can be conventional, non-conventional. And then I'm gonna make the uh, tacos on open fire, warm them up. That's all we really need. Garnish with uh, onion, tomato. Well, tomato is also a little unconventional, but some people enjoy it. Um, and then cilantro. Now, <laughs> there's a couple of people in our group who don't like cilantro, so, um, I haven't put cilantro in the in the salsa or the marinade. However, you can still garnish with it. Sometimes camping meals are dehydrated packets or hot dogs. But if we're staying at one location for a few days, we like to enjoy a fancy meal every now and then. Well, more often than not, to be honest. Tacos, whether you make them the Mexican way or the American way, are a quick and delicious camping meal for when we want to feel a bit fancier. There's also no better way to warm up tortillas than on fire. And you know what goes really well with tacos? Delicious, sweet corn on the cob, straight from Chilliwack, BC. Look at that. After supper, we had a little downtime, so I asked Courtney to tell us a bit about her vehicle and her camping setup. So I've got a 1998 Land Rover Discovery One. Um, I went with the Discovery 1 over the Discovery 2 because uh, these come with solid front ax axle and uh, center differential locking. Like the Disco 2, they actually disconnected uh, the CDL, so you can reconnect it, but I'm um, like, it's just kind of easier. This sort of model is just really easy to work on. It's not like the Land Rovers you have no nowadays, like no air suspension, nothing, like, nothing super fancy. I put in a two inch terra firma lift kit um, and steering stabilizer, and then I put uh, Wrangler Kevlar's um, on it as well. Uh, I need some, need to figure something out for the rubbing, but it's like, it's not too, too bad. It's only rubbing on the inside. So gotta go pretty wide around the corners. Just this, uh, this part right here, that's all. So you can kind of see in the dirt where I rubbed it a little bit, but uh, these Wrangler Kevlar's are insanely bulletproof. Like I uh, did Bible camp last, or a couple weeks ago, and um, I aired it down to like, I don't know, it was like 15 in the front and 17 in the back and you couldn't even tell that they were aired down at all. Next time I go rock crawling, what I'm probably gonna need to do is take out my sway bar because it just wasn't getting like quite enough flex, but my favorite upgrade to this vehicle were the Land Rover cup holders. Got them off another vehicle because it did not come stuck with cup holders. Um, yeah, so my wonderful little brother helped me build just we took some two by 12s and some plywood, created some space underneath, and this top part just slides forward all the way to the front seats. Front seats have to go all the way up. And then uh, created like little brackets to put supports just like over the, the foot wall there. So that slides forward. And um, unfortunately I can't put the seats up unless I take out this piece of plywood, but uh, whatever, it's COVID. So not going with anybody. My favorite part is the safari windows because you wake up in the morning and you can like look out of the sky and it's just really lovely. So I try to park it in a beautiful beautiful spot wherever I go. So Land Rovers definitely get a bad rap for being completely unreliable, but I've had this for a year and I've kind of beat the heck out of it on the trails. And the only thing I've had to replace is 
a thermostat, a $10 thermostat and $5 fix. So every, all the work that's been on it so far has been by choice, thankfully, knock on wood. Um, so far so good, but yeah, it's, it's kind of like a glorified lawnmower, really. You just, you gotta go with the old ones and so much less electrical work and stuff like that. Courtney. Hi. <laughs> How you doing? I'm good. I was just about to put the camera away and then I saw you. <laughs> Yeah. What's going on? Uh, well, I noticed. <laughs> I can get it. <laughs> you noticed the reliability of these uh, Land Rovers? Okay, yeah, I know I commented on the reliability, but yeah, I was noticing coming here that um, my brakes, when I was stopping, I was like pulling to the left a little bit. Um, so I just like take a look to see if there's, if I can like visually see anything wrong. And I yeah. also neglected to mention that there was a bit of damage, um, but you know, I, in my genius, I fixed it. I ripped off my side mirror, my driver's side, just duct taped it back on. It's working beautifully. Hey, duct Very tape nice. is the way to go. Duct tape and zap straps? I don't really see why you need a toolbox. Zip ties. Zip ties. Okay. Zap straps. zap straps. It's like so. the weirdest thing. Weirdest thing. But yeah, duct tape and zip ties fix a lot of issues. I don't know if they'll fix my brake issue. I highly doubt it. Yeah. Yeah, maybe a little bit of axle grease. I find that helps as well. Okay. <laughs> Hot tips. Mechanic. Do not apply axle. axle grease to your <laughs> to your brake pads. You may not stop. Ugh. All right. Not taking your advice. <laughs> Brian. Yeah. What are you doing? Baking some good cookies. You're baking cookies. Yeah. That's a euphemism, baby. What? Oh yeah. Just Look at that. Box. Shove it in there. Dude, that's nuts. Give it some time. That's metal, dude. Yeah, I just, <laughs> yep. Get it? Yeah, that's it's metal. metal. That's metal. <laughs> <laughs> Is it our self cleaning? So you're used to like. So, look at that. Yeah, but still. Cookies. Mm. Cookies. Oh, how's it going, ladies? That was cool. How are you doing? Thirsty. Thirsty? <laughs> <laughs> you want a beer? Uh oh. oh <laughs> Gotta... What'd you find, bud? I found myself a nice Smirnoff ice. Uh-oh. You can do it. You're doing great, sweetie. Woohoo! Atta girl. Boom! Well Very nice. Okay, who did that icing? I bet it was this guy. I was hoping you'd get it. <laughs> oh, is that right? Well, now that we're all set up, I thought I'd just give a quick tour of where we're all sleeping tonight, what we've all got. We've all got like different kind of setups, eh? Yeah. So Rachel and Ryan have this uh, crazy rooftop. rooftop extravaganza. What's it called? A Vagabond Drifter. A Vagabond Drifter. So we're excited to, to learn more about that. Uh, Nick is here with his gazelle tent. It's set up really quickly in like less than a minute. Yeah, nice, it's very quick. Nice and roomy. He and Meezy will be sleeping in there tonight. Um, and here's Rachel looking super comfy. Hello. <laughs> and then we've got uh, our, our pop-up tent right over here as well. This is also an instant tent sets up in uh, a minute or, or less. First, yeah. It's a dark room technology tent. So dark room technology. It's dark on the inside. And let's you guys can come say hi to Rocky because he's in there sleeping. Okay. So kay. come on in. Come on in. Hi Rocky. Oh it is very dark in Oh <laughs> Seriously. That was good. That was good. Bad props. You got me. Bad props. You got me. <laughs> Cheerios. This was not the last icing of the evening. I got Jordan back. It was actually really nice that the whole crew didn't arrive all at once because we avoided a lot of the chaos that goes along with it, and we were able to gather firewood and set things up beforehand. On the next episode, we're going to take a dip in the freezing river water and cool off, and then we're going to drive around to explore the area. So we'll see you back here next week.